Hello, friends. Welcome to the Logistics of Logistics podcast. My name is Joe Lynch. Thank you so much for joining us today. On the Logistics of Logistics, I talk to experts in logistics and transportation, warehousing, fulfillment, supply chain, and of course, technology. And during these interviews, I'm always the one asking the dumb questions. I ask the dumb questions so you don't have to. Today's topic is the grocery and produce supply chain with my friend, John Gillespie. John is the Chief Technology Officer at Megacorp Logistics, one of the largest freight brokerages in the United States. One of Megacorp's specialties is the grocery and produce supply chain, where the bar is much higher. To learn more about the always challenging grocery and produce transportation space, please take a listen to my discussion with John. How's it going, John? It's going well, Joe. How are you? Very good. Very good. John, please introduce yourself and your company, where you're calling from today. My name is John Gillespie. I'm the Chief Technology Officer here at Megacorp Logistics, and I'm calling from Wilmington, North Carolina. Very nice. Very nice. Megacorp Logistics. Now, what do you guys specialize in? What do you guys do? We're a full end-to-end, multimodal, third-party logistics broker and the 4PL space as well. Specializing in full truck load, less than truck load, and drayish and international. We have offices in Cincinnati, Jacksonville, Florida, and Morgantown and Elkins, West Virginia. And we're expanding soon to Charleston, South Carolina, and Charlotte. Yep. And you said Cincinnati in there, right? I know you're in Cincinnati. I did. Yes. Yeah. That's our second biggest location today. We're, we have the, the most of the people here today in Wilmington, but Cincinnati. And when you come in the logistics space, that's the Mecca. Yep. And I know one of the areas you guys specialize in is grocery and produce supply chain. We'll get to that in just a minute. Who's your sweet spot? Who do you guys normally work with? We love everybody, but I would say probably in our, our top 10 today, uh, sweet spot when it comes to, like to customers in this space, especially in the grocery uh, supply chain, would be like uh, Chobani, HP Hood, um, Costco, Harris Teeter, Kroger. Okay. So you work with a lot of retailers and I'm assuming you also work with some of the produce companies. This A lot of times people say CPGs, but CPGs and cold is a lot more stuff. You do a cold chain stuff, so a lot harder. <laughs> That's right. At, we're also at the at the farm side as well. So think about like where they, they grow cucumbers to make pickles and stuff. And in Sun Coast, you look at blueberries and strawberries and avocados and things like that. So Awesome. Awesome. So tell us a little bit about you. Where'd you grow up? Where'd you go to school? Some career highlights before you joined Megacorp Logistics. Oh, thanks for asking. So I'm actually a military brat. My dad was a Marine, so I was born at Camp Lejeune. And got to bounce around a little bit while he did his 22 years of service. But he did the whole boomeranging. When you're in that long in the Marine Corps, there's only so many bases you can go to as you climb up that ladder. So I was very lucky to graduate back at Camp Lejeune High School in 2002 and then stay here in the East Coast of North Carolina and attend UNCW, University of North Carolina, Wilmington. Back in the early 2000s, if you wanted to be in the IT career, probably similar to, to the automotive industry, as we talked about before, the certification route, more that hobbyist technologist, that engineering side, the universities weren't really caught up to everything, the nuances of the tech side of careers, where today you can get cybersecurity degrees that didn't exist. Everything was around like computer science. And then if you wanted certifications, everything was like Cisco certified kind of pieces. I did a whole bunch of certifications in the summer of between each semester of college and then even after um, college to get the alphabet soup between A plus, network plus, security plus, and Cisco stuff. But my degree focus was political science. So I thought I had a delusion of grandeur to become a lawyer. Luckily, post 2006, you run in 2008 into the big recession that it, that occurred. IT stability jobs were probably better suited for a lot of us than trying to continue to pull out loans and stay in education. And nothing against those that can continue on to master's degrees and doctor degree programs. I was more like a tinker hobbyist in IT space. So my first job, big boy job out of college was at Liberty Healthcare as a help desk and then sysadmin and then to, and to network security with them. And then I came over to Megacorp as a night dispatcher, so completely on on IT related. But when Ryan Legg, our current company owner, founder, him and his wife, Denise, when they left Cincinnati and he used to be the co-CEO owner of TQL with Ken Oaks, and he got out of the business and he was looking to do this again, he had a very people-centric first uh, approach to it. And the culture what he was establishing here in Wilmington was very hard to ignore. And I had a few friends that moved over to Megacorp at that time. This is about 2012. 
And it just caught my interest. And I was like, if I get my foot in the door, they'll notice my sweet IT skills later in life. My life took a slightly different turn in the two years that I was on a dispatch there through 2014. I met my wife and we decided to do a semi-permanent honeymoon to Hawaii. So between 2014 and 2019, we lived in Hawaii where we had our two children, a girl and a boy, eight and six. And I, while I was out there, I worked for American Savings Bank and Kaiser. And then pre-COVID, we moved back and I ran into the CFO, Matt Props here at Megacorp, outside of work because I wasn't working at Megacorp, but he knew that I moved back. And he asked if I wanted to come back to Megacorp. And I was like, well, I'm not going to come back to Night Dispatch this time. I'm now 15 years into my career outside of college and IT experience. I would love to help you guys through a, a major digital transformation at Megacorp. And so that was probably a seven month conversation with him while I was still working for Kaiser on what that would look like from the internal IT department size and what that meant to that company, my company Kaiser at that time to make sure I handed off correctly in succession planning. And then when it would be appropriate to come over. So I came over in March of 2020 back to Megacorp and been here since. At that time, we had 325 employees and about 325 million in revenue. And then the and we're now about 700 employees and a little over 980 million in revenue. And we have, you have seen basically this industry. I think we're probably compared to some of the other industries you worked in. I'm assuming we're a little behind technology wise. And I would say now we probably caught up and maybe surpassed some. That's funny you say that. With my team, when I came in 2020, and was setting like a strategic goal of what we needed to catch up in technology, where we were behind cloud adoption and high availability and security things. I called it the coming to 2017 plan, even though it was 2020. <laughs> and then there was no digital transformation catalyst like COVID than anything else. And not only did it disrupt the supply chain to, you know, to talk with you earlier, like what was available at grocery store shelves, we saw a shortage of chips. You couldn't find specific IT hardware. There was Vendors were telling us 90 week delays for ordering switches or servers. That's a year and a half or two years. Like why yes. do they say that? <laughs> that means it hasn't even been procured at a Silicon level to be made. So quite comical. And then you saw everything being locked up the, the blocks of the Suez Canal and some big political disruptions and stuff between like China and Taiwan and you know, things out of Ukraine that consumer in our daily lives we saw was the, at the car automotive level. The, where Ford had to leave a lot of vehicles in the lots because they just have the chips to sell them to, to be made. And then on the IT side, we had to pivot and whether it was transportation and probably the same within banking and like healthcare places that have different regulation mechanisms. But for us, if we were going to go from a company that has office spaces, but then trying to get hundreds of employees to work remotely, how do you do that? Like, What is the new phone structure look like? What does the VPN structure look like? What does everybody look like with laptops or monitors in their houses and all those applications. So there's a big, strong pivot um, over the last few years away from traditional IT infrastructure within data centers and offices and those thick clients and everything going mobile, web-based, um, which is fun. And to your point, a long story short, um, there's probably been huge mechanisms over the last 20 years to drive EMR, healthcare changes, some of the robotics and things where doctors saw it's advantageous in that kind of innovative magnet to pull things in hospitals. Banking was a, a big, how many of us now still go into a bank to cash a check or anything when you can do it mobily? You really have to go there just for those specific signatures on big things. So that, that was consumer driven too. In, this, in the transportation space, we're probably still seven, 10 to a generation to where We'll see major changes at like shippers, receivers, and carriers where there's like bigger tech pieces, but from companies like ours, and then the ones we've been talking about like earlier, the CH Robinson and, and those, they've sunk millions, if not hundreds of millions, as they say, into IT. And a lot of that is around internal accountability. As we discuss uh, things, especially in the, gro the grocery produce supply chain, the risk is so great in that loss and commodity and stuff when, you, when you're dealing with you know, 80,000 pounds of chicken to strawberries. If you have a claim on that, it can be hundreds of thousands to a million dollars. And not a lot of companies can survive that, much less a lot of carriers. So the onus on digital transparency through that integrity is big. So yeah, it was a, it's, it's a big thing. I talked to uh, a lot of people on my podcast and a lot of people will, will just, whether we're warehousing or transportation quickly say, oh, we do everything and we don't do, we don't do cold chain and food. And I always think, oh, okay. Food is everything, right? That's a big, that we all have food at our house. Knock on wood. Thank you. That is right. And, but it, 
is a harder thing to do. And I know I'm talking to the CTO, but I really do like the idea of talking about the grocery and, and produce supply chain. We talked about it before we hit the record button, how it is much harder. So a lot of companies just shy away from it because they, by the way, I worked for a company, great company. And I remember we did some very difficult loads. And I remember I said, oh, I have this opportunity with this food. They're like, no food. <laughs> Shut up. Get out of here. I was like, really? What? Why don't we do food? They're like, oh, let us count the ways why we don't want to be involved in that. And I was like, oh, okay. It is, I'm not saying you're the only ones doing it. Clearly, there's lots of people doing cold chain, but the bar is much higher. And we'll talk about why in just a minute. Since you are the CTO, talk a little bit about your tech. Do you guys, did you go buy a TMS or did you make your own? And Or a lot of other companies say, we started with a TMS from some company and then we added our own proprietary mix on it. We've looked at several, even when I was here previously at Night Dispatch back in 2012 and where when the company founded in 2008 till today, but there's no silver bullet in the transportation management space to satisfy all of our needs. Now, to your point, even about the difficulties of the produce, this grocery perishable space, how would a TMS account for the tracking of all the refrigerated frozen plus the commodity itself through that full life cycle at the same time that maybe they're tracking the individual warehouse items that maybe people have from nuts and bolts to manufacture the cars in the automotive space to even some of the odd things we'll call like the TV show office, like you're tracking paper and pencils. I'm into it. So to be a marketable transportation management system means you have to fit enough to gain the most market share, to be not niche, to where you can just be for like across the US or across the globe, like somebody can use you for whatever they are. But then you have to reconfigure that to adopt to whatever the company that's trying to use this tool, this system team has to be good at. We, we've sunk a huge amount of our IT resources, personnel-wise and money, and developing our own transparent management system in order to take control over that configuration aspect of it. We There's actually quite a few great off-the-shelf products today that are visually, from a UI standpoint, workflow standpoint, great. And then they have configuration functionality behind them that you could make it match within your system. But that's back to that square to round peg and it's an easy question to answer when you're small do yes. we just do something no we clearly buy it off the shelf and if we want we can modify it over time and maybe we buy some add-ons maybe we build some add-ons but when you're larger and you have the capability to create some of your own stuff why not i think the majority of us in the top 30 all created our own tmss and the 3pl space i think there's maybe one or two that still use an off-the-shelf product. To my understanding, I, I don't look at the market research. Well, even the ones who are using off-the-shelf are probably have a whole bunch of their own proprietary interfaces. Or Anyway, let's switch gears. Let's talk about the grocery, I think it's a tongue twister, the grocery and produce supply chain. So I want to talk about, I listed one, two, three, four, five points that I wanted to talk to you about what makes cold chain. And again, you guys serve customers in this space. You serve a lot of grocery companies, a lot of produce companies. And these are the five things that we we're talking about for hit record that makes it a much more difficult business. If you do it every day, perhaps you say it's a little easier, but the bar is just much higher when we're talking about this stuff. So what's the first thing that makes this biz different and harder? From my perspective, being on night dispatch, just watching the carriers sit at the shippers to get loaded, the produce or anything in the grocery space is almost never ready on time, right? If you're working with Kroger and to pick up strawberries across the United States, most of the time we have to account for multi-pick then to multi-drop for that specific grocery. So that's multiple pickup locations. So that means multiple farms? Multiple farms. That's correct. So there's no one giant, we'll just say like a Driscoll or Suncoast farms. Like you're to fill up 80,000 pounds on a refrigerated truck, like you're going to multiple spots in order to get there. And then you're dropping them at multiple stores. Or, or do, you, do you drop at the DCs and then it goes to the stores? 
It'll depend on that customer. So some of the, the big, larger, major ones that you've seen, like anybody that flies today or drives by major like depots, you'll see like the big Walmart distribution spots or Dollar Tree or, or Dollar General does as well. And then you know, like Amazon has their ones. So they'll do distribution points and then do last mile for somebody else. But for some of the big grocery stores that do it really well, especially knowing how perishable it is once a good is on the shelf, that Best Buy date, and you know, they want you to go from picking up at those three, four farms and then start driving and drop it off at those three to four Kroger's uh, along the way. And they unload two pallets, six pallets and at a time and depending on where it's going to go. And well, uh, that's, I, I mentioned to you before we hit record during COVID, it seemed like I bought some fruit and thinking more like long berries that seemed like they went bad almost as soon as I brought them home. And I was thinking probably wasn't sitting at the store for a long time. It probably got delayed because of COVID. We have, there's a shortage of trucks and a shortage of workers. And and so I was like, oh, you, you don't have a week. When you bl- bring those blueberries home during COVID, you better eat them that in the next day or two or they're going to go bad on you. That's exactly right. Like in this space, and there's so much in the health considerations to consider. We see some things in the news around like in the salmonella risk with like certain lettuces and stuff that like will have that. And you just have to imagine what were the conditions like at that farm temperature wise that exposed it to the, the growth environment of that period versus it being refrigerated because you can't freeze lettuce and then freeze it. It becomes like mush to then get to that location to then be be still edible to the consumer in the high volumes. And so, I mean, there's a lot from that beginning to end that is difficult. And it's the same even in the, the frozen space. A lot of the frozen life cycles are like longer, but that's only if frozen upon picking or upon the processing of that meat. Like you can't pick it and then let it wait a day and then freeze it because that creates a different risk as well. Yeah. And I think with uh, a lot of stuff that comes off out of farms and again, this big generalization, but if it's August and you say, we just picked this produce, it's 90 degrees because it's 90 degrees outside. So a lot of this stuff has to go into pre-cooling and then be given to the... Inexpensive and expensive because you're running that diesel within that refrigerated unit to get it down to that temperature. That's the same. So especially here in North Carolina, like we have the big like chicken, turkey, and pig farms with Smithfield and Tyson. And they have that same... They have the problem on both sides at that shipper that's doing the... They're producing the chicken and those things. Even if through that process, they have to cool that down too. Because that is a very hot, intensive machine factory process. So you have to temperature 40. If you don't cool that produce down quickly, it becomes much more perishable. So if you say, I, I picked it and now um, I'm just going to sit for a day, then I'm going to put it through my cooling process. It's more perishable. So <laughs> this the bar is much higher. Again, I said it before. So uh, also when you talk about multi-pick, if I've got a cold chain, that means I'm, I'm monitoring that truck. I want to keep that tr- temperature the right one. But I'm also stopping at multiple places to load. And then when I'm dropping off, I'm opening opening the door many times. I'm in Michigan. It gets very hot and humid here in the summertime. The further south you go, I think the hotter and more humid it gets. And I can't imagine it being very good for the cold chain. So we the, again, the bar is just so much higher We're talking about multi-pick, multi-drop, but one of the next thing I want to talk about is cold chain monitoring. No one wants to hear your excuse that, oh, we had to open the door multiple times. That's why it came out of temperature range. It has to stay in temperature range. Yes, that's exactly right. And we stay probably fortunately or unfortunately on top of the carriers through that whole point. That's the logistics side of it. So when we plan on the picks, we will map out where those farms are for the optimized route to get in and out of each one. Um, And then pre-call on the way to make sure we do pickup time at 6 a.m., 7 a.m., 8 a.m. to get to each before it's that heat of the day, Um, but then also through it to make sure they can then get on the right road. So if you're crossing the United States, like very key interstate paths that are um, beneficial for trucks, pretty much the only reason they were kind of designed is for that that trucking um, piece across it in order to minimize that. And then even the cooling of the refuel unit itself, control it from that back of the truck all the way up to the front to make sure it's all organized in there correctly and safe and you know locked down so it doesn't fall and come over. We have a full, we call it like night dispatch, but it's part of our 24-7 full dispatch services, covers nights, weekends, huge chunk of the hours a day that not only cover that service, 
from pickup, but then we check on throughout the life cycle of load from through the journey to the drops. And then upon delivery, we do that proof of the bill of lading to that proof of bill of delivery, either through text or emailed over to us with one of our various IT systems. And then we also do the real-time tracking, whether that's also GPS driven through uh, phones or through ELDs in order to stay up on top of it. And this is the most of these companies and they're backed by factoring companies, larger commerce, or even owner operator um, side that are in the reefer side, the refrigerated unit business. Like they're aware of our con- con- constant, consistent touch points with them. Cause to your point uh, now, when you bought those blueberries and they went bad within a week or less, you know how much you paid for that one carton of blueberries. Now imagine 80,000 pounds of blueberries. Oh yeah, absolutely. And by the way, um, when we talk about cold chain monitoring, we've had cold chain for a long time, but we have not had the monitoring of that cold chain nearly to the extent. And I think the, the Food Safety Modernization Act, I'm sure USDA is probably similar, says to the, of the trucking company, you have to be able to prove that it stayed within temperature range the entire time it was in your unit. That's relatively new. And I think most of the newer trucks have the ability to do that. And I think we can see... Usually, I don't know if you, it's in, within your system, I suspect for some where it says this is coming, there's an alert in the cab. So the driver says, for whatever reason, something's wrong that we're coming out of temperature range, we need to pull over, take care of it. And I think for a lot of times you hear the companies itself at dispatch or even at the logistics freight brokerage, they get that same message saying, okay, warning, Will Robinson, if you guys get that reference. <laughs> yes. Now, that's still also ripe for innovation, probably in this space. ELDs drove a regulation point to get within the trucks, electronic ROGs at the reefer unit side. They do have internal cabin temperature monitoring good themselves, but um, there's probably still like a cost component when it comes to the IoT for how many of those can feed back to cellular services to feed out to all the units. And there are a large number of, of carriers that are, are doing that. When you as say well. IoT, that's Internet of Things. So that's a, that's a temperature monitor. Right. And then I think Tive and a few others. Make I always some call work. it the internet of trucking, but it's really the internet <laughs> of things. Like a Tive track or a pack safe, some monitoring system. And by the way, that is not just for your customers. The Food Safety Modernization Act, through the FDA, requires this. And so I don't know the USDA as well, but I knew, I'm, I'm pretty sure it, it's similar to the Food Safety Modernization Act. You have to be able to prove that you're staying within temperature range. And you have to be able, it's not good enough to say, hey, John, I dropped that off and uh, yesterday and everything's good. But I did notice that it came out of temperature range uh, for a few hours. Is that a problem? You're like, yeah, it's a huge problem, but now it's too late. I have to, we have to have real time alerts and we have, a, have to have a process to make sure we stay within that temperature range and be able to prove we stayed in that temperature range the whole time. That's the expectation that your customers have and that your customers and their customers, which is all of us. <laughs> right. Yeah. Us as Americans, we want to make sure we're buying healthy Tostitos and chickens and lettuce and stuff. So it's for a good reason. It is another barrier to entry within this space on the carrier side and shipper because it's another cost of concern and another what looks like a regulation uh, on the outside. Some guardrails. <laughs> yeah, but that's really what is it? That's all it is. It's guardrails. And I hope in time, as we see these IoT, the internet of trucking, I like that phrase I'm going to use every now and then with the things like Tive, get cheaper, almost like the Apple tile devices are getting that sub 20 to 10 to down to $2 more disposable. It will make it easier to upgrade some of these older refrigerated like units that not everybody's caught up to that just only has the cabin versus talking externally to where it becomes more commoditized and standard versus a barrier to, to regulation because it is, it's beneficial, but just with all things there's still risk and there's still cost associated with it. So not everybody wants to work within that space. So, so if you look at these, I, I, I haven't looked at it lately, but I believe the Food Safety Modernization Act had, they want to be able to measure by the product, not by the truck. Because when you think about that pallet had a journey, right? It went from getting loaded somewhere at a farm, being loaded onto a truck, and at some point taken off that truck and put into uh, either a, a DC or a store, um, we have to be able to say almost, I always say it's like the cop shows the chain of custody. We all know how the chain of custody, we can't, we have to know that evidence 
has been not contaminated. We even more important, we need to know our food was not contaminated on the way on its journey from the farm to our table. So I believe they want monitoring at the pallet slash product level. So we're not quite there yet, I don't believe, but we can be, it's just very expensive. And to your point, we need to lower the price point. So we say, yeah, we have, we can tell you what that product went through from beginning to end at the product level, at the SKU level. Yeah. And you know, there's going to be some probably market factors that I think help drive this along for the next like few years. When the, when it makes the news for like recalls, like salmonella, like on lettuce, they'll say, hey, if your product was bought by this Kroger, or you bought it at this Costco, it probably came from this farm region. So just throw it out and get something else. And to your point, that's not individualized is probably where it should go to understand like that risk um, for it. So we can then circle back and make sure there's better compliance and maybe some of these farms are out there. Uh, but we have to remove that barrier. If, so in the United States, I can't say the farms are one of the most profitable things because the way we have to subsidize them. And then they have those astronomical costs for the John Deere equipment out there and managing the farms themselves. Um, so to, to put the burden on them for one more thing that is really just like on that back end for the covering. Like it's the same thing that we have to do from a technology standpoint every time we run into a cybersecurity event in either the, the company or end of the industry is like your end. And the old like CEO from Mandiant back then was at a conference and he said, he's not a matter of if, it's just like when that event like occurs. And it's better to tell the truth and be able to give people the details. This is what happened and how it happened. This is what we're doing next. And it's the same thing in this produce space. If we can, to your point, get more palletized and get individual um, for it, I think that's just going to drive consumer like safety, like up. And it's also going to be like the competitiveness of these grocery stores between the Wegmans to the, the Kroger's, the Harris Tears, the Food Lions, the Whole Foods down the line. They can only offer so much more like in services, so much more in store experiences and so much more in quality of food to where the other mechanism of trust is knowing you're not going to get E. coli or something. We are remarkably good at what we do right now because there's very seldom do you ever get something like, hey, if you bought spinach at these stores uh, or this brand, don't eat it. That's very seldom do we hear that. And if you got to a place where we already don't eat enough of our vegetables and um, fruit, but um, if we ever get to a point where you say, the reason I don't the reason I won't buy spinach or lettuce is because it's usually bad or I got sick once. That's bad for everybody. So we don't want that. Anyway, let's get back to it. What makes grocery and produce supply chain much more difficult? First, we talked about multi-pick and multi-drop. Much more difficult to manage that, especially the pickup times have to coincide with the right time of the day so it's not too hot, not too cold. Then we talked about cold chain monitoring. It's a whole it's a whole thing all by itself. We talked a little bit about the Fed regs. So there's the Food Safety Modernization Act, the, the USDA. You guys have to make sure every carrier you're working with follows that. So you guys have to understand it yourself. And then you have to make sure you communicate that not only in, a, in your sales pitch, but also when you're talking to the carriers. Make sure I'm not hiring carriers who don't get it or who don't value it. If you find a carrier that doesn't value this stuff or doesn't have the right equipment to deliver what you need or what your customer needs. We've run into those kind of like fraud risky situations, but we have, to, to your point, this probably goes back like the acceptable, like lost profit, like ratios. What do we consider good versus great? And don't let good be the denial of like perfection. Our, we have a huge internal like carrier team that vets carriers through four different systems and they're all google out there and i can always tell them or anybody that were to ask but we don't lie on a single source of truth right we don't only go to fmcsa or only to rmis or highway product we have multiple ones we do because they updated information on that carrier could be off at each one depending on insurance information mc information number of refrigerated units and, and and drivers and the last maybe there's a red flag that's something out of compliance and they clean it up and then our carrier team will actually go out and call those insurance companies to validate it outside of that site there you go and, and then we set a pretty crazy bar that like we don't work with any carrier that has not existed for more than six months or if they've gone out of compliance they still have another six months delay and then we create 
an internal kind of like tiering coding system with because we like part of our own proprietary TMS side is we haven't worked with any very consistent external carrier databases. We built our own in order to create a history mechanism of load compliance. So our own scorecarding of those carriers from pickup to deliveries on these lanes for these commodities all the way down through it. Yeah. So we have a, a pretty crazy vetting process internally. Yep. And so before we hit record, we were talking about this, another thing, and I find this, so everything we talked about so far, multi-drop, multi-pick and multi-drop, that's hard. Cold chain monitoring, it's what you do, but it's a little higher bar than most loads are. Having to comply with Food Safety Modernization Act, making sure all of your suppliers do that or your carriers do that, USDA, same thing. All that's difficult. But then you said, yeah, and then you throw in, it's seasonal, meaning I put together this great team and I hope that great team is back next harvest season. And I hope that I have enough continuity in my own business with my own people, but also with my, all my carriers. So I got to think it's a constant communication, training, onboarding to make sure this thing doesn't fail. It is. The uh, seasonality is Interesting because you know, almost everything has a, has a season across the United States. So we'll do blueberry season to the strawberry season and the chicken farms and eggs they'll have. Those are a little more consistent based on life cycles. But then even recently, since we're in early January, we have the Christmas tree season. That's another big right. market that we're in too. And that's, you prepare for it all year and you make sure the internal freight brokerage teams and commanders that we have understands who those customers are, where locations are, but then the farms. But that's... That's a true point of that loose tightening, that peak and valley of the market. And, and to make sure there's actually truck drivers available to, to move that product because Christmas has a pretty hard date on it. So they get the trees out the location. So does Thanksgiving. I'm sure you guys do poultry. So you're delivering those Thanksgiving turkeys, not quite as valuable in mid-December as they are in mid-November. <laughs> That's correct. So then if you make that full ripple effect all the way back full cycle, if you're now dealing with multi-picks of... Christmas trees that is only during this season that also you don't want to dry up and go bad because they're going to be sold at these specific farms they and, burn really quick. <laughs> and they're going to be dropped off at multiple locations. And then that really is between you know, our relationship with the truck drivers and that customer internally, like that's a make or break it for that season. Like for a lot of them, it's an end of year. It's, it's a livelihood and you don't want it to go poorly because there's no round two and the trees have to grow again. And wait till the next season. Yeah, exactly. So we have, we also have weather in there. So when the crops are ready depends on, when the harvest is ready depends on the weather, which is not always completely dependable. <laughs> yeah, not at all. <laughs> Doesn't do what we years. expect it to do. Yeah, and you have to manage your carriers because they, they, they have to be, they have to be carriers that are comfortable with seasonal because they have, they, they might, they have, carriers have options. They might say, you know what? That with you, John. I'm tired of this seasonal. I'm moving over here where it's not seasonal. This is the bar is much higher on this. And then the last but not least on this is perishable. All of this stuff you're talking about is perishable. And I use this term a lot lately is perishable doesn't mean that it just necessarily went bad. A turkey doesn't have to go bad if it's a day late to Thanksgiving. (laughs) Uh, Halloween candy the day after Halloween is worth very little. Christmas decoration, the, 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 the eggnog isn't that useful in mid-January. So it's really time dependent. But also when we talk about perishable, we're talking about potentially poisoning somebody. Food poisoning is no fun. You guys have a much higher bar to deal with and it's not easy. No, luckily the with the way that we've staffed into understanding how to like monitor refrigeration versus frozen throughout properly planning the lanes from that pick the multi-picks multi-drops and things that are also perishable um, ensuring the right amount of diesels and refrigerated units to, to run or even the routes um, that we try to optimize with the truck driver to tell them to drive or assist them through that driving if they you know, have to deviate due to bad weather as well it can change how they're going to deliver something or bridge collapses current pennsylvania year or so ago and how you get uh, around that. We also try to make sure that those like truck repair shops are potentially like around just in case, right? Because you don't want to your point, 80,000 pounds of turkeys or pumpkins or Christmas trees yes. or 
to go bad because the refrigerator part broke, you have to make sure you repower it and you get it off of that, out of that truck and then repelletize it and move it over to something else. Cause you have a very small window um, threshold before you, you break that not only compliance regulation, it was USDA or FDA forced upon at temperature, but then also just the trust with the customer. And then the end goal, which is us as a consumer to still want to buy their product, use our product. So we know that as well, which is why we even have sub teams, not only just in the claims department, we have like rapid response teams for an event of like breakdown in order to assist carriers on the repowering and the, the support functions around refrigerated units that will hopefully prevent some of those risk and perishability besides some of the delays that can occur at the pool of the product that's weather wise or even the transportation of across the United States. I love it. I love it. John, I know I'm going to lose you. So I am going to summarize <laughs> this and I want you to put a big bow on this. So we we're talking to John Gillespie over from Megacorp Logistics and they are, we're talking about grocery and produce supply chain. So some of the challenges with it right now is multi-pick and multi-drop makes it a much more difficult to find the right carrier the scheduling, everything is much more difficult. Cold chain monitoring, again, another another thing that you guys have mastered, but it's not easy, not something easy to get into. Uh, making sure you're meeting all the Fed regs related to food, which is that Food Safety Modernization Act and all the USDA stuff. Again, a higher bar. The seasonal nature of the products you guys move makes it a little higher bar again. And then last but not least, this is perishable stuff. We're all well aware. We've all brought stuff home from the grocery store and had it go bad on us. We know how important it is that stuff arrives fresh at the grocery store. Final thoughts. Put a big bow on this, John Gillespie. I appreciate that, Joe. Here at Megacorp, the reason we love this side of the industry, we're not only a produce, grocery, perishable market space, but we don't say no to it because we definitely live by that philosophy, like we leave no load on the dock. And then we purposely staff our internal company at a higher operational value, probably at the sacrifice of some profitability to make sure we have the right partnerships with those customers and carriers to follow us 24 seven. That's what it takes to be in this business. So be it, because just like you said, I love my blueberries. I love my strawberries. Uh, <laughs> I love steak and chicken. And as a, an American and shops at these same grocery stores to be a part of that process, to be a part of that supply chain, to know when you drive down the road and we see like around here, the interstate's 95 and 40 and I see those truck MC numbers. And I know the farms that are around here too, to be a part of that at all is an incredible benefit just as a person in the community and society. So I, I enjoy this company and I enjoy what we do. And I enjoy knowing that our service stands above others across the industry. But in this space that is challenging, it is risky. We're not going to shy away from taking upon that challenge. My, my assumption always is if you can do this, you can do the other side of the business. So if somebody says, hey, can you do some dry van stuff for you? are like, yeah, we, we got that. that. <laughs> exactly. We love that as well. We love all aspects of what's provided in our multimodal space. If you can manage the rigor of this, which is again, all the difficulties that we just discussed, you manage the rigor of this, you can manage the rigor of the other parts of this business. So what I'll do, John, is I'll put a link to your LinkedIn profile, I'll put a link to your website, any other links you and your marketing team give me, I'll put those in the show notes so people can write, reach out and talk to you. John, what conferences will we see you and the fine folks from Megacorp at this year? It's a great question. We have a pretty big marketing team and a lot of sales directors. So we will definitely be out at the chicken show, the produce show. I have some people from IT doing the BGS. We'll be at TIA, Freight Waves. A lot of those bigger sales focused shows in the produce chicken space we love. And then the ones where like Whataburger attends and yeah, they'll be out there. But I can provide you those notes as well if you want to link them out there so you can so, see. Our well, I think we know if given the size of your company and given what some of you said, if, if you're looking to talk to Megacorp, it's easy. You'll find them and they'll find you. So again, I'll put a link to the link to your LinkedIn profile, the website and any other links and people will reach out and talk to you. Brian Harmon won the British Open. I don't think many people don't know who Megacorp is because he wears our hat. Oh, <laughs> very nice. Very nice. Yeah, I didn't know that. I don't watch a lot of golf. Could you get him to play football maybe? Yeah, I know. I, we've thought about sponsoring inside other sports, whether it's been uh, football to NASCAR and those things. The The golf one has been a little more fun for us because a lot of the customers are aware of it. 
And you guys want an excuse to go to the golf course, just say it. We, we get That's it. right. <laughs> and the seasons just run longer. There's almost like a major golf tournament, like 12 months a year, not just like only during the spring football season. So I love it. Thank John. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate you sharing your knowledge with us. Anytime, Joe. Yep. And thank all of you for listening to my podcast. Your support's very much appreciated. Until next time, onward and upward. You have been listening to the Logistics of Logistics podcast, where we engage with leaders in the logistics and supply chain community. If you like what you hear, please subscribe, hit the like button, and leave us a nice review on Apple or Spotify or wherever else you listen. Also, please check out our videos on YouTube and connect with us on LinkedIn. We're very big on LinkedIn. And you can also reach us on the logisticsoflogistics.com, our website.